Well, hello everyone, uh, hello everyone online and everyone that's here with us. Um, tonight we have a great presentation in store. Uh, Max Andrews is going to take us through some of the issues surrounding the many worlds of the multiverse and God. Um, first, a word or two about the NCAC and about Max himself. The NCAC seeks to fulfill a fourfold purpose. First, to inspire and educate Christians in Calgary to show that traditional Christianity is intellectually reasonable and plausible. Second, to network with apologists in local churches and other ministries who will act as a resource for apologetic expertise in their ministry. Third, to prepare apologists within our network for their role through personal study and interaction with others. And fourth, to directly respond to those who seek to disprove, undermine, or redefine traditional Christianity. And now for the bio of the man of the hour, Max Andrews. Max obtained a bachelor's degree in science, a bachelor's of science degree in religion with a specialization in biblical studies, and a master of arts degree in philosophical studies, focusing on philosophy of religion, both at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Max is now in Edinburgh, Scotland, where he's in his second year as a PhD candidate at the University of Edinburgh. His PhD is in philosophy, focusing on the philosophy of science and the philosophy of physics particularly. His thesis is on fine-tuning and the ontology of multiverse scenarios. Max's blog is at sententias.org, that's S-E-N-T-E-N-T-I-A-S dot O-R-G, where he regularly blogs and produces his podcast, Eavesdropping. He's done several public debates and presentations on the existence of God, which are available on YouTube, and he taught Introduction to Philosophy for three years at a graduate, as a graduate assistant at Liberty University. Max also worked as a senior writer and content administrator for Reasonable Faith, the ministry of Dr. William Lane Craig, for a year. Aside from many worlds in the multiverse, Max has interest in theology and, as such, he has done research in and work on Molinism. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight, Max, and I'll let you take it from here. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. I've had to uh, pace my day out, so to speak, uh, being so far ahead in our uh, time. I've had to take two naps in order to get where we are today. So hopefully um, everything will be helpful for the audience, both for you in Calgary and everybody listening online. So, and thank you for the introduction. So, our agenda is really threefold, what we're going to do here. The first one is going to, uh, we're going to work out the different models between uh, the multiverse. So, in this section, I will discuss different versions of the multiverse, which are primarily four different models, and we'll learn how to distinguish and identify the differences between them. The second section we're going to talk about fine-tuning and uh, a little bit about the cosmological argument and how the logic behind all of that is going to work. So this is obviously one of the most prominent objections to fine-tuning that we see. So I'll briefly discuss the, the multiverse or how the multiverse does not circumvent the problem of fine-tuning. Um, and also, this will help clarify the logic and methodology behind our reasoning process. For example, with the, in the role of science, ordering of the premises, realism, etc. And our last section, which may be the most interesting section, in my opinion, is if there actually are universes, then what? So, if we say in our apologetics, if we say that the multiverse doesn't get around fine-tuning and we're stuck, so to speak, with a multiverse, then what are we going to do with that? What does that mean for theism? What does that mean for Christianity? Where does this fit with the Bible? Now we have to, have to swallow this horse pill, so to speak, and take our theology of nature and use a scientific theology to work out a coherent model for Christianity in many worlds. So that, I think, will be the most interesting section. Uh, it may also be the most controversial section, but uh, I'm really looking forward to this. 
So let's get our term straight first. What are we talking about? Um, there's many different terms used to refer to the same thing. Multiverse, many worlds, MWI is short for uh, the quantum, uh, many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, multiple worlds, multi-world, world ensemble, I've, I've even heard megaverse before. They generally refer to the same thing. Now, as we'll get to it, Multiverse is not a monolithic concept, so there's four different versions of it. But when we, when I say multiverse or many worlds, I usually use those two interchangeably as my choice terms. We're not referring to what's called possible worlds or feasible worlds. A possible world is... Uh, a semantic device used to describe a maximal state of affairs. So um, there's going to be a very close correlation with possible worlds as we get further into our discussion, but um, possible worlds, generally speaking, are abstract concepts, and feasible worlds are just another logical progression of that uh, that concept and this isn't necessarily like uh, depending on the models it, we're not talking about um, different floating planets in another solar system that look just like you etc um, but it'll be pretty close to that but we just I want to make sure that we know what we're talking about and then we'll get through our hierarchy. So these are Max Tegmarks. He's a, a, a precision cosmologist is the title that he prefers. Uh, he's a physicist at MIT. He's worked at the Max Planck Institute and he's he uses four general categories when working with the multiverse. The level one, and we'll go through in more detail, the level one simply means that there's more space beyond what we can observe. It's a little bit of a misnomer, but there's more space. This is not a very controversial one. The level two multiverse is the idea that most of us may have when we think of many universes. There are other bubble universes, um, so to speak. Uh, the level three is where things start to get really weird. This is specific to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so um, when you think of parallel worlds, this is the version that you would think of. And then level four is the coup de gras. Um, he is, uh, Tegmark is a Platonist, so he takes mathematical existence to be equivalent to physical existence. So let's break this down just a little bit more, and so we have a good, um, for our first section of delineating um, these different approaches. So the level one multiverse. So some of the features, same physics, assumptions, space is infinite. That may be the most controversial um, uh, assumption or postulate built into the system here. But this would, it, it's not too controversial among cosmologists and cosmogenists. Uh, cosmology being the study of the, the large structure of the universe, cosmogony being the study of the origin of the universe. So some of the evidences that they would cite is that the cosmic microwave background measurements point to a flat, geometrically flat, infinite space, uh, large-scale smoothness. Now, um, if you look in the lower right corner, you'll see um, a two-dimensional universe there with, and each universe has 
four different particles and you'll see the arrangement of these particles. So imagine this two-dimensional universe with space for just the four particles. Such a universe has 10 to the power of 4 or 16 possible arrangements of the matter in the universe. If more than 16 of these universes existed, then they're going to start repeating in on itself. In this example, the distance to the nearest duplicate is roughly four times the diameter of each universe. So you can see that right here we've got the identical universes repeating itself. So in the same space, um, so this is where it really is a misnomer. Ergodic matter just simply means that there is some there is something or there is matter that is occupying some spot some point um, anywhere in the field that we're describing. Um, so in this could be an infinite space of matter extends infinitely. So uh, I forget the exact measurements, but the measurements that he gives for at least universes or things starting to repeat in our universe, um, if applied to our universe, which has about 10 to the 118th uh, subatomic particles, you'll see, uh, depending on where you go and how recent the literature is, you'll find different numbers for how many different subatomic particles there are. Uh, one of the most popular ones that I've come across is an older one um, that I've seen Roger Penrose use, which is 10 to the 90th particles. Tegmark's most recent publications, he's using 10 to the 118th. Um, so since my research primarily revolves around Tegmark, I'm just going to go with Tegmark on this. And one thing to keep in mind here is that I'm not a scientist. I'm just working with their data and uh, interpreting it, so to speak. So there is 10 to the 118th subatomic particles in our universe. The number of possible arrangements is therefore 2 to the 10 to the 118th, or approximately 10 to the 10 to the 118th. Multiplying the, the diameter of our universe, which our universe is 8 times 10 to the 26th meters, the diameter of our universe gives an average distance, the nearest duplicate of repeating matter, repeating formations, or repeating you, which would be 10 to the 10th to the 18th meters away. So level one multiverse, by calling it a multiverse, it sounds a bit misplaced, but we have repeating uh, repeating matter, repeating arrangements of matter the farther you go. Level 2 multiverse is the one that most of us have in mind when we think about many worlds. So some of the features of it, uh, it has the same equations of physics, um, but perhaps different constants, particles, and dimensionality. So if you look at the uh, this bottom picture, I don't know if you can make out the colors quite well, but in the, this is a computer simulation program, and each peak, each sharp peak here would represent a Big Bang in inflationary cosmology, and some of the peaks have different colors, and so just one peak may be different colored. The different colors represent unsettled physics or unsettled, unsettled values for the physics for that universe. Our universe after would be somewhere in a valley where the uh, physics and the values of the physics have settled down, have been set. So the universes that are functioning that are set are in between the peaks. So these peaks are big bangs in other universes or 
yeah, in, in other universes. And the universes themselves would be settled in the peaks. So this, the red areas, and the valleys, that's where we would get in this landscape that's where we would find um, universes and if they're functioning. So some of the uh, assumptions put into this model is that inflation occurred. Um, inflation is just the mechanism that drives the, um, the exponential growth and speed of expansion of the early universe. This is generally non-controversial. Um, We've had, I'm sure you may have seen headlines in the news about BICEP2. Um, that study has been very controversial itself because it's had different reviews and has had, which claims to confirm the theory of inflation, but it's come across its own problems with uh, having cosmic dust at, when you would think about a cosmic dust getting in the way and throwing off so much data, I would imagine when you put so many years of study into something and then you get dust, cosmic dust in the way, uh, as part of your calculations, you just want to throw your head through a wall. So uh, to me, that's kind of under understandable. But um, with inflation, it solves uh, the issue of the flat space. So if you think of, if you're looking at a balloon, when we look at, think of the flat space, um, when you blow up a, um, a nice round balloon, not one of those weird ovular ones, but a, a good round balloon, when you um, start blowing it up, you're going to notice it's, that it's very round if you're on the surface of it and say you're... Um, you're microscopic and you're standing on the surface of the balloon, you're, go you're going to easily see that the s surface of the balloon is round. Now, when you quickly start inflating the balloon, the balloon is going to start looking more and more flat. So now switch the analog from standing on a balloon and noticing that it is very round to standing on the earth. When you're standing on the earth, say you're standing on the beach, I don't know how many people in Calgary have ever been to a beach, but I can imagine you can get the picture in your head. If you are looking out at a very flat horizon, it's very unlikely that you're going to notice the curvature of the earth you're not going to notice the curvature of the Earth until you're at a certain elevation and your sight, your line of sight can be, it is not obstructed by whatever may be in the atmosphere um, and you're going to be at a certain altitude. Then you can start maybe seeing the curvature of the Earth. So that's kind of where the flatness comes in. It's almost akin to standing on something so large that even though it may be round, it does seem flat. And so if we're going to make a measurement on the Earth's surface, or a generally small measurement, say, I don't know, from um, neighborhood to the next neighborhood, the geometry, if you, if you make a triangle, you're going to get the sum of the angles equaling 180 degrees. But if I were to make a triangle from Edinburgh, Scotland to Calgary down to uh, Cape Town, South Africa, the measurement of the angles are going to be quite different. It's going to be greater than 180 degrees. And so that's how we would know that we have some type of curvature. Now the curvature that we do measure with our universe is slightly above 1, and 1 would mean it's a flat universe, or geometrically flat. And if it were an open universe, so to speak, it would kind of be like inverting it. So the sum of the angles for the triangle that you would measure would be less than 180 degrees. It's kind of, if you uh, were to draw a triangle on 
a, a saddle for a horse or I uh, take a piece of paper and then fold it uh, and then you draw the triangle uh, with straight lines you're going to notice that um, it's going to have different measurements. This also solves the monopole problem. Now a monopole are um, they're magnetic mon or magnetic monopoles are extremely massive particles carrying a net magnetic charge which is a result of predictions made by all the grand unified theories. By combining these grand unified theories like M theory, string theory, super string theory, etc. with non-inflation scenarios the expected age of the universe is no longer 13.73 billion years old and it becomes about 30,000 years old. Inflation eliminates the monopoles by arranging the parameters so that inflation takes place after or during monopole production. So the monopole density is diluted to a completely neg negligible level. So we've never been able to find any of these monopoles that should be there. Um, so if there were, if inflation is not true, we should be observing monopoles and the age of the universe would look uh, and measure to be completely different than what we do measure it to be. But inflation solves that problem. It keeps the mathematics for what would describe the monopoles but it keeps it consilient with the evidence that we do observe while still accounting for that. And some people uh, may also say that it explains the fine-tuned parameters and this may get into one of those anthropic principles that we just happen to live in one of these valleys or one of these bubble universes in which physics are just right. The cosmic lottery, the cosmic jackpot, this is where people will usually uh, turn to the multiverse as uh, an escape from fine-tuning. So here would be uh, another example of how this is a hierarchy. So levels 1, 2, and 3, and 4, they are, have simple titles, but you have to remember that it works up in a hierarchy. So a level 4 entails 3, a 3 entails 2, and a 2 entails 1. So you're going to, this may sound mathematically weird at first, but it's kind of infinites within infinites. And mathematically you can do that, but when you start try, trying to apply that to the physical world, you start getting weird ideas and it starts to, to me, I, I would easily concede it hurts my brain, but this is what it would, what we, uh, what we get here. So this is what it would look like, so to speak. Um, so inside these, I hope you can see the mouse here on the screen. So we've got these other bubbles, so to speak. And then within the bubbles, you've got other universes. So we've got our universe here that we referred to in the previous slides. And then it's got duplicating universes throughout it. And then, so let's just say that um, each one of these, so we've got a green, a red, and blue, and they've all got different colors. So if we look back at the computer simulation here, let's just assume that the colors correspond to each of the different valleys where the universes have settled. So this is what it would look like when you start building the hierarchy of uh, from a level one multiverse with the infinite space and then it's going to start uh, repeating in on itself and then you've got more infinites added to it. 
So is there any physical evidence for this? Well, this would be something that would be, um, this isn't one of those gotcha, we've got hard proof evidence for it. This is, this is a modest claim. Uh, this was a paper that came out in, I believe it was 2012, but they would, they're still waiting for uh, better data from the Planck uh, satellite data. On the right-hand side of the screen, the better-looking one, the purple, that is the Planck one-year uh, cosmic micro microwave background survey. So after the uh, Planck satellite surveyed the uh, cosmic background radiation for a year, this is the data it came up with. And you'll notice that this bright strand that we see right in the middle, that's the center of our galaxy. So we can't see past that. And what's interesting is that we can really only observe, it's about 4% of the universe, um, which is incredibly small when you think about it, but it it's also a massive amount that we can actually observe. But we're able to get the, um, the measurements um, and the isotrop uh, isotropy, uh, and the, we can notice the homogeneous nature of the universe in its early form. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, we have... Um, our current data of the uh, CMB measurements. I forget which hertz, I think this might be at 94 hertz. Uh, there's different measurements. So when you look when you look up, if you were to Google cosmic microwave background radiation, you're going to get different images because it depends on which frequencies uh, you're looking at or, or it's being measured. So you'll notice here this red band, we still can't see what's beyond that. So a lot of the measurements take place outside of this. And you can zoom in many exp exponential factors. So you could zoom in on the slightest dot here. And um, it, it's really quite interesting. If you could give a print out of one of these things, you could post it on the side of a skyscraper and still get the finest detail out of what you're observing. Now in this bottom image here, it's this image, it's the same image and data used from the top, but certain algorithms have been applied to it and we start noticing these spots here and the authors of this paper gave this technical, a technical name for these spots. They call them blobs. That's about as simple as it can get. <laughs> so the signature of a bubble collision is what they th are thinking that it may be. In the early stages of, of the universe, be uh, before or during the stage of inflation, uh, our universe bumped into another universe. So this, this is, think of this as the screen to uh, our early universe because before this, there was no matter or light or light that was visible. So it's kind of the, the shield. We can't look past it anymore. So this is as far back to the past as we can view. So... Um, what the authors are suggesting to, of this paper was that this, these are signatures of a bubble collision at various stages in the analysis pipeline, so to speak. So a collision, that top left quadrant, uh, induces a temperature modulation in the CMB temperature map, uh, which is the top right quadrant. The blob associated with the collision is identified by a large... Um, needlet having to do with um, isotropy and anisotropy and iso, um, in response to the bottom left. 
and the presence of the edge is determined by a large res uh, response from the edge detection algorithm. So I don't have the algorithm to show uh, what they did and how they arrived at these conclusions, but they were very modest in saying that, okay, the, e the evidence and the data that we're working with is not as fine-tuned, it's not as uh, clear as we would like it to be. So they're waiting for the seven-year Planck data to come through in the next couple of years uh, to go through and apply these same measurements and apply the same uh, algorithm to see if they come up with similar data. So this is a spark of evidence, I would say. This isn't the smoking gun, but this could be a spark to say, look, this isn't that outlandish of a thought. Uh, now, here is a number that is, to say that it's astronomically large is actually an understatement in the most literal sense of the term. <laughs> um, so there's um, a prominent cosmologist, Andre Linde. He co-authored a paper with Vitaly Venturin in April 2010, simply titled, How Many Universes Are in the Multiverse? So we've heard different numbers. We've heard of uh, there being an infinite set of universes, and we hear other people saying that there's a finite set of universes. And later on, I'm going to say, it t to me, it's Personally, it doesn't really matter if there's an infinite set of universes or if it's finite. But if it's finite, I think that kind of it's more of a softball home run for us, uh, so to speak, if I can use that language, uh, to say that uh, it makes the case for fine-tuning a little bit uh, easier because um, the way that causation is going to have to work. Um, but when I start talking about the infinite uh, scenarios, that's going to kind of change the approach a little bit. So they use the calculations of uh, what's called slow roll inflation. If you think about that, um, that computer simulation with the colored uh, peaks and the colored valleys, um, the universe, think of uh, the universe kind of early universe as kind of a ball that kind of rolls down the hill and then it kind of settles down into its settled values for its physics. And so there's, there's different types of inflationary scenarios. So this is one that they use. They use slow roll uh, inflation. And so they came up with a number of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 7. And just saying that is just exhausting because when you think about it, the number of elementary particles in our universe is 10 to the 118th, I believe it was that I referred to earlier. So that's just two exponents short of a total number of universes, which is, I, I can't stress how incredibly large this number is. Uh, it's it's quite incredible, um, but it's also going to seem very small once we start talking about some of the theological um, aspects to it and why 10 to the 10 to the 7th may be insufficient for the type of creation we might expect if we have certain theological assumptions. And I hope that planted a seed of interest there, but We'll come back to this number a little bit later on. The level three multiverse, this is where it gets weird. Now, um, uh, so remember, we're building on the hierarchy, so the feature is the same as level two. Some, some of the assumptions here is that physics are unitary. Now, when we say that physics are unitary, that means that the probability of any outcome is one. So in, you, you may have, if, if any of you have read on quantum mechanics or have watched videos or 
or you're a quantum physicist there, um, then you've probably heard that quantum mechanics is all about probabilities. Everything is set out in a probabilistic nature. So where a wave function, where the outcome of a particle is going to be, is really determined probabilistically. But unitary physics says that the probability for everything is always one, which means everything is always certain. So that means from the get-go, this interpretation of quantum mechanics is deterministic. So there's some indeterministic interpretations. The classic one that you may hear the most is the Copenhagen interpretation. That's um, the interpretation primarily founded by Niels Bohr, I believe in the 1920s. Uh, he's the one who really hammered that out, and that is a, I hesitate to say this, but a mind-dependent de interpretation because it's dependent on the role of the observer to collapse the wave function, so to speak. It determine, an observer determines where uh, a particle will be. Now, with, um, with many worlds and other deterministic interpretations, another inter uh, deterministic interpretation would be the de Broglie-Bohm interpretation. Uh, with these interpretations, observers are not, you know, sentient beings looking down and making a measurement. A, an observation could be any particle interaction, whether or not a conscious sentient being is observing it. So it could be any particle interaction, measurement, observation, anything like that. So um, when we say observation, a lot of us have in mind, okay, I'm doing an experiment and this is where the particle is after I do my experiment. I see that the particle is right here, or at least it was right there. But um, the semantic domain for observation in this part of quantum mechanics also includes interaction with other particles, etc. So some of the um, some of the weirdness involved here. Uh, I'm sure many of you may be familiar with uh, Erwin Schrödinger's cat experiment. Well, not an experiment. That would have been really weird and almost cruel to do to a cat, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, but it was a thought experiment, I should say. And what he did was um, you put a cat into a box um, and you've got some uh, a, a decaying, let's say plutonium. You've got plutonium in there and it decays at a random rate and you've got a detector that would um, detect whether or not this decay has occurred. Let's just say an alpha or a, or a beta particle decay, um, well, or uranium. That doesn't matter, really. It's something that's not good. And when that de uh, detector detects that decaying particle, the hammer drops and it kills, it, you know, will drop on a poison and kill the cat. So the thought behind it is that you don't know the cat you don't know if the cat is dead or alive until you actually open up the box to make an observation so the cat is both dead and alive it's in what's called a superposition um, so that's the kind of um, entanglement that we would get in quantum mechanics and particularly in the many worlds interpretation the whole universe is entangled. This was an idea that um, Schrodinger himself came up with in a, I believe it was a 1935 paper he delivered at Cambridge. And when you start describing uh, the state 
of particles, you have to describe them in relationship to other particles and then those relationships start expanding and then once you make an observation you as an observer you start becoming entangled and a part of that system and then when you start extrapolating it the whole universe is one big entanglement and so everything would be in a superposition so the cat is both dead and alive at the same time and depending on your interpretation of quantum mechanics the cat's going to turn out dead or the cat's going to turn out alive in that single world but in the many worlds interpretation with the probability of everything happening always being one the cat is going to die in some universes and the cat is going to be alive in some universe in other universes so I don't know if you can read the graphics on the right screen so kind of think of it this way um, and it's not it's kind of a, a misnomer to think of it kind of like a film strip that splits off but it may help uh, with the imagery here you know it, you've got the guy approaching the woman and he says hey do you want to go grab a drink and in one world she says yes let's go get a drink and then they've got a family so lesson learned if you go out and have a drink you get a family in the other world she says no thanks I've got plans and they go their separate ways so both outcomes occur a yes and a no resulted in two different but very real worlds so um, there are some of the evidences there's experimental support for unitary physics ADS is anti de Sitter space and uh, conformal field, field theory. Uh, this is the equivalence between string theory and gravity. Um, a loss of coherence between the angles of components in a superposition and a loss of information due to environment, which gives the appearance of uh, wave collapse. So decoherence is something that mimics wave function collapse. So wave function collapse in quantum mechanics is that determining outcome. But in many worlds, in the many worlds interpretation, there is no wave function. There's only decoherence. So a wave function collapse occurs when the outcome of a quantum state is determined by an observer. An observer can be a conscious observer, as I previously said, or an interaction of particles. Instead of a determinate state, decoherence is akin to pooling one string out of an entire knot of strings. In 1956, Hugh Everett published his PhD dissertation titled The Theory of the Universal Wave Function. In this paper, Everett argued for the relative state formulation of quantum theory and quantum philosophy, which denied wave function collapse. Initially, the interpretation was highly criticized, and arguably still today, by the physics community. And when Everett visited Niels Bohr in Copenhagen in 1959, Bohr was unimpressed with Everett's most recent development and really just pushed him off. In 1957, Everett coined his theory as the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics in an attempt, in an attempt to circumvent the problem of defining the mechanism for the state of collapse. Everett suggested that all uh, orthogonal relative states are equally valid ontologically. In other words, that means that um, everything that all possible states are true and exist simultaneously. So decoherence is what prevents us from experiencing more on the macroscopic uh, level. So decoherence is what prevents us from seeing ourselves split apart. So these aren't magical instances where we're just continually splitting like this film strip. This occurs in what's called Hilbert space. It's, very, it's a very small but infinite dimensional mathematical space, uh, if I can use that language, um, where think about it as the universe continually folding in on itself. 
Um, if you've ever looked at a fractal or made a fractal before, you can, and some of these uh, programs where you make a fractal, the smallest, you know, you can go down several different layers, but think of the layers as dimensions, and you change one thing 20 layers down, and it'll have an effect on the first layer or the top layer. So if you think of, if you've ever seen one of those crazy videos, like it's almost something you would expect if you were on LSD or something where you're continually zooming in and zooming in and zooming in and everything keeps looking the same, but you keep zooming in. That's kind of how, if you think of the universe continually folding in on itself like that, um, that would be the best analogy for Hilbert space that I can think of at the moment. So we'll come back to this one in a little bit when we start talking about the theological aspects. The level four multiverse, this is the coup de grace. This is Plato's ideal world. This is where uh, everything is mathematical. And it's, it would really be akin to saying that physical existence is really secondary. Physical existence is almost illusory. So some of the features, um, you know, we would have complete, this is where you can just run amok with the ideas for a, what a universe would look like. So you've got different, uh, you, you can have different physics. It's not, it's not like saying, well, uh, the value of gravity is not 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, kilogram over Newton meter squared kilogram squared over new, Newton meter squared. Uh, it's not like we're just changing the value of gravity. Um, it's a universe where there is no such thing as gravity, but there's something else, and it's just it can just be pure speculation at this point. So mathematical existence is equivalent to physical existence. So this would be the ultimate answer, so to speak. No. Um, John Wheeler and Stephen Hawking would ask the question, why these equations and not others? Well, we just happen to live in the universe with these equations. And the level four multiverse, there's other equations that exist. And everything is just purely mathematical. And this is uh, a commitment Tegmark makes and something that I am quite critical of, in be not just for um, myriological reasons, like saying that numbers exist, so to speak, but that you've also got um, abstract to abstract causation, abstract to concrete causation. Um, so instead of mathematics describing physics, mathematics is physics. So that's kind of the, you can't get any more than this, so to speak. Okay, now this is probably where, where you come across the idea that, okay, this is just weird, you've read too many comic books. Um, I've, actu I've actually got that reaction before. Did you get this idea from a comic book? I can honestly say that I, I don't recall ever reading a comic book in my life. I don't know if that makes my childhood sad, but I don't know. Uh, I, it, it's not. I know that in a, I was told in a Superman comic a multiverse was introduced where there are many different Earths or something. I don't know. So I wanted to define some of the things here and suggesting that you know this may seem weird, but we can't discount it. Weirdness would be really an aesthetic claim. To say that something is weird, um, that would be that kind of goes into the forbidden category when we're talking about philosophy of science or things or scientific, uh, scientifically speaking, when things are weird, it's an aesthetic claim. So it's a different category altogether. So if you've ever heard the claim, it's just a theory, um, or you know, when we talk about uh, evolution, I'm sure this has come up before, or maybe you have said it before, or you've come across somebody saying this before, 
oh, well, evolution is just a theory. Well, so is gravity. Gravity is not a law. Gravity is a theory. And theories are actually much more robust than laws. So theories are um, robust and are composed of axioms and laws. And depending on how we use the multiverse, the multiverse as is without any explanatory, if we're not using it for any explanatory hypotheses, it's really a prediction. So it's not just a theory, it's a prediction based off of theories. So let me define a theory real quick. A theory is distinct from a mere scientific explanation. Scientific explanation requires a causal explanation, which requires a law-governed explanation. Natural law describes but does not explain natural phenomena. Newton's law a, of universal gravitation described but did not explain what caused gravitational attraction. Theories unify empirical regularities and describe the underlying process that accounts for these phenomena. Within theories are axioms, um, like you would get uh, small spot, uh, postulates like um, Euclid's axioms, very basic postulates in mathematics, um, just axioms that don't get, that aren't broken down any further, so to speak. And um, these are not proved in the axiom system, but are assumed to be true. A theory goes beyond natural laws and scientific explanation and explaining the scientific explanations. So it's not just describing, it's actually explaining. A theory refers to a body of explanatory hypotheses for which there is strong support. Theories are a conjunction of axioms of the laws of nature and correspondence of rules specified in a formalized ideal language. This ideal language is composed of three parts, logical terms, observational terms, and theoretical terms. The logical terms were initially treated as analytic claims, particularly under um, different approaches to um, science like the hypothetical deductive model, which I won't get into, but um, you would be using deductive reasoning in your science. Um, observational claims were to be unproblematic, understood as referring to incorrigible sense data, and later to publicly available physical objects. Correspondence rules were used to connect theoretical language to observational claims. So what we're referring to, it's not science fiction. Um, it, it's, there is pretty strong theoretical evidence, and I would venture to say, go out on the limb here and say that there is empirical evidence for at least some of these multiverse scenarios. So um, the prediction comes in as far as um, it would be result of the inflationary scenario, the measurement, uh, the geometry of the universe. It would be a predict. Um, a prediction, we would predict many, many universes as a result of inflation, etc. So that's where the multiverse comes in. And it would come in as a theory, um, as an explanatory hypothesis, if we're trying to explain away fine-tuning, so to speak. Uh, it would come in if we're trying to use it for other than just saying that it is uh, a result of natural phenomena if we try to use it in an explanatory hypothesis kind of way, then it becomes more theoretical in the theory sense. So what about fine-tuning? So this is the uh, fine-tuning argument that I used in my, uh, my master's thesis and uh, defended. And so I can give, you know, I'm sure we've all heard many different examples of how fine, finely tuned our universe is. 
so, for example, the I'm not going to go through a lot, but just you know the strong nuclear force. Um, if it were larger, we would have no hydrogen um, atomic nuclei. Uh, for most life essential elements, would be unstable, thus no life, no chemistry. If it were smaller, the value of the strong nuclear force no elements heavier than hydrogen would form. Again, no life, no chemistry. Um, it'd be the same thing with gravitational force. If it were larger, stars would be too hot and would burn too rapidly and too unevenly for life um, to produce the chemistry needed for the heavier elements. Um, if it were a smaller value, the stars would be too cool to ignite nuclear fusion, thus many of the elements needed for life would never form. So, you know, I can go through the list. Um, I'm sure you can find a list of uh, some of the constants, some of the values and parameters, and you can see that everything is very uh, specified and very complex. So the argument that I would use here is premise one. It's an abductive argument. And we'll come back to the abductive approach um, after I've summed up this part. Uh, premise one, given the fine-tuning evidence, a life-permitting universe or multiverse is very, very unlikely under the non-existence of a fine-tuner. Premise two, given the fine-tuning evidence, a life-permitting multiverse is not unlikely under the non-existence of a fine-tuner. The conclusion, therefore, a life-permitting multiverse strongly supports the existence of a fine-tuner over the non-existence of a fine-tuner. So it's basically saying that the rule here um, is that would be premise one. That would be the rule that we're working with, um, that given this fine-tuning evidence, a life-permitting universe is very unlikely under the existence of the fine-tuner. The result of the investigation would be the premise two, uh, given the fine-tuning evidence, life-permitting universe is not unlikely under the non-existence of the fine-tuner. And then our conclusion would be the case. So it is the case that a life-permitting universe strongly supports the existence of a fine-tuner over the non-existence of a fine-tuner. And um, I've gone through lengths in my thesis to, of course, defend this as a major part of my thesis. But notice I'm only using the word fine-tuner. And here, it, when you're looking at the symbols here, uh, so the probability of a life-permitting multiverse given the non-existence of a fine-tuner, a little tilde means not, and k prime, and k will refer to background knowledge, and the double less than is, is very, very unlikely, or much, much less than. Uh, k prime, that I'm being very modest and restricting our background knowledge that excludes other arguments for God's existence. So, as you can see, probably pick up on my approach here. I'm an evidentialist and I'm going to use a cumulative case to argue for God's existence. So when I use a fine-tuning argument, I'm not going to arrive at God because God is very uh, is a very robust um, being. It's a very robust concept. It's very loaded. Um, this says nothing about God's power or his love or, or any of those attributes. This just says that wh whoever this being is, this mind, this fine-tuner, this fine-tuner is very intelligent, and it's simply arguing for a very intelligent mind. So let, what, let's look at some of these in uh, where it would correspond to our concerns. So inflationary fine-tuning, there's four primary mechanisms that cannot vary. These are, now in some of the scenarios that we were 
looking at in that computer simulation, the values of the physics were changing or have changed. Um, but in order for that to work, in order to have that landscape of inflation to work, there has to be undergirding mechanisms for that to even function. So these four mechanisms, primarily four mechanisms, the first one is a mechanism to supply the energy needed to form the bubble universes in the first place. And that mechanism is the inflation field. If the inflation, if inflation is not complete or efficient, then the remaining energy density within the bubble must be fine-tuned to give the correct value distribution. Attempts to circumvent fine-tuning concerning the inflation field have focused primarily on describing what occurs posterior to the moment of bubble inflation. So we have to go, you know, inflation will try to describe what happens afterwards, but this needs to be front-loaded into the scenario in order for it to work. So things will change afterwards, or can change afterwards, but it has to be built into, or pre-programmed, so to speak, into our multiverse scenario, into the inflationary scenario for it to work. This isn't just simply a life-permitting universe. This is just a functioning universe or multiverse. The second mechanism uh, would be uh, a mechanism to form the bubbles. This would be Einstein's equations in conjunction with the field equation. Now, when you look at this bottom right hand, or the bottom of the screen, you're going to see a, an equation. This is a very famous equation. This is Einstein's field equation. And the, possibly the most recognizable term in it is the lambda here. It's the, it's, it looks like an A except there's no bar in between it. So it's the Greek uh, L, so to speak, it's lambda. And so the history behind this equation was that Einstein was trying to fit the measurements, uh, the geometry of the universe with a static state universe. And so this would, this lambda, this cosmological constant was what he referred to as his fudge factor. Well, actually, I don't know if he referred to it, but um, history referred to it as his fudge factor. He kind of built it into the equation to balance the equations to make it work. Edwin Hubble came around um, and made the empirical observation that the universe is not static. Um, and also, um, oh, the name is escaping me at the moment. Um, he was a Belgian priest, and he used um, Einstein's own mathematical equations and said, no, we can't have a static state universe. It has to be expanding. And so once, uh, once Einstein went to Edwin Hubble's observatory and saw the evidence for himself, you know, it was a great embarrassment. But you can't just simply delete something from the equation. So if you're looking at the equation, the left-hand side of the equation describes the curvature of the universe and the right hand describes the energy momentum. So if you look at the uh, G and then the, um, the subcase, the mu and the nu, um, those are metric tensors, and the T mu nu, that is the momentum tensor. And so in this situation, the lambda is describing, this is the original form, it's describing the geometry of the universe. But what we would have to do in order to balance the equation is move it to the right-hand side of the equation to balance it out. 
and so the cosmological constant now describes the energy momentum of the universe. It now describes the rate of expansion of the universe. So the inflation field that gives empty space a positive energy density is needed to achieve mechanisms one and two. Without either factor, there would neither be regions of space that inflate, nor would there be nor would those region, regions have the mass energy necessary for a universe to exist. If, for example, the universe obeyed Newton's theory of gravity instead of Einstein's, the vacuum energy of the inflation field would, at best, simply create a gravitational attraction causing space to contract, not expand. And the third one is a mechanism to convert energy of the inflation field to the normal mass energy we find in our universe. And so those mechanisms are the famous E equals mc squared with a coupling between the inflation field and the matter fields. Although some of the laws of physics can vary from universe to universe in M theory or this grand unified theory of superstring theory, so to speak, these fundamental laws and principles underlie M theory or this unified theory and therefore cannot be explained as a multiverse selection effect. Further, since the variation among universes would consist of a variation of the masses, the types of particles and form of the forces between them, complex structures would almost certainly not resemble the energy and matter stru and structure that we observe in our universe. Thus, the said fundamental laws seem necessary uh, for there to be life in many of the universes, not merely in a universe with our specific types of particles and forces. What is more is that these four mechanisms are not independent from one another. The fine-tuning of our fourth mechanism, which is the super string theory itself, um, uh, must be fine-tuned in order to have the three mechanisms to function and bring about any functioning universe or life-permitting universe. So this is even more modest to say that we need a functioning universe that would allow for or for a universe to even um, exist. You know, there are universes that would inflate and collapse right away or some universes that would expand way too rapidly and then just keep expanding and then, you know, stretch apart. And then there could be some that just that they're docile, as docile and non, that could have life but don't have life. Um, so, but are life permitting nonetheless. So these are the mechanisms that don't vary in an inflationary scenarios. Now in quantum fine tuning, this, <laughs> you may look at this and just roll your eyes, but bear with me for a second. Um, the first uh, postulate in, uh, in Hugh Everett and Max Tegmark's work is that the whole universe evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. And there's different forms of the Schrodinger equation. There's the time-dependent and the time-independent variation, but this is, or vari variations, but this is the one that um, Everett uses. So in this equation, um, we've got d over dt, that's the differential um, with respect to time and the function equivalent to uh, i. i is that imaginary number, the square root of negative 1. When you think about it, it's kind of weird how um, an imaginary number has a real correspondence to the physical world. Um, I would just find that very interesting. So we've got um, i over h bar, and h bar is Planck's constant over 2 pi, multiplied by the Hamiltonian, which is the h there, and the Hamiltonian used here is, it describes the energy of the system, and that Hamiltonian is the conjugate of the state. That, that psi there is what would usually denote as a wave function. So this notation here, this straight line and this arrow line, this is called a ket. And if we were to have another 
um, arrow, so to speak, pointing the other way. That's called a bra. That's these are Dirac notations for describing um, the state of particles or systems. So this whole mess, if you want to call it, I don't think it's a, it may look like a mess, but it's actually very specific. Um, uh, describes the superpositions of of particles alpha and beta. So let's just say that the superpositions involved uh, for the alpha particle has a spin up and the beta particle has a spin down. So it, there's different spins that say an electron can have. It's either spin up or it's spin down. And it has to do with its angular momentum, etc. But for simplicity's sake, sake, we'll just go with the two, something that has two options, up or down. Um, okay. So what we have here, let me see if I can. Um, there we go. I've got a uh, pen if needed. So we've got superpositions of. Uh, alpha and beta. So the U here is just a time operator. It's a linear time operator. So and the X with the circle through it here, that just is a notation for let's just say together with. So and then the faces are just well let's just say the outcome of how we would perceive them. So before a measurement is made um, we, we've just got the blank stare going on. And this would be the non-collapsed state of entanglement. Remember, we're entangled with the universe. We're part of the system. So this is kind of the hypothesis here of the non-collapsed state. If we perceive a spin up, then we're going to be happy. And if we perceive a spin down, we are going to be sad. So that's kind of spin down, sad, and spin up. Well, broke his face there. Spin up, it's going to be happy. So here's the collapsed entangled state for alpha and beta. So this is uh, after decoherence has occurred. Um, this is the actual outcome of what's going to happen. So for um, the superpositions of uh, alpha spin up and beta spin down, you know, before the outcome, we've got that blank face. But after everything has occurred, which is what that equal sign will notate, we're going to have both outcomes here. So we're going to have alpha spin up, um, and we're going to be happy, and we're going to have uh, beta spin down and we're going to be sad. So both outcomes occurred here. So, whoops. So both outcomes occurred. Now notice that we've got a conjunction here. This uh, plus sign. This isn't an either or. So in, in any other uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. After you do the superposition and, and the uh, quantum entanglement, you're not going to have uh, an and. You're going to have an or. You're going to have one outcome. And so you're either going to be happy or you're going to be sad. But it will be the case that you are going to be happy and you're going to be sad. And it just depends on which world you're perceiving it in. And remember, this is after the, the, the loss of information in the system um, after decoherence. And what's really important about decoherence is that decoherence, you know, Tegmark has a paper out there that says that there is no information in the universe. And information is really illusory. But what it, it, he kind of shoots himself in his in his own foot when he's uh, in that paper in that paper because 
there re it's required in this interpretation for there to be, so to speak, an, an infinite amount of information for this to unravel, so to speak. So if you think of a big ball of yarn and you're losing information and you're pulling that string and it's unraveling, it's going to have to be uh, front-loaded with an infinite amount of information. So that information is going to have to be ordered and specified in a certain way for this whole thing to even function and occur. So just the whole function and outcome, the superpositions involved, um, and the unitary nature of physics would have to be fine-tuned. And Don Page, who's a very prominent um, astrophysicist, he, he worked with Stephen Hawking. He's also um, an evangelical. He has uh, what he calls the optimal argument for God's existence, in which he's, he argues that he takes more of a Leibnizian role and says that uh, God has uh, picked the best possible world, and the best possible world is one where there is elegant laws of physics and God does not want to um, violate quantum unitarity uh, and so on. So we'll keep going for a stretch of time to get to the more interesting points in, my, um, in the talk. Um, I'll briefly go through this one real quick. I don't want to keep you too long here. So this is, uh, this is an argument that um, I've come up with Dave Beck. Um, he's a professor at um, Liberty University. And this is uh, an abductive cosmological argument that we've uh, come up with that, that you don't have to worry about um, theories of time. Uh, you don't have to. It works with basically any cosmo, uh, cosmological model or any cosmogony. So, premise one there are contingent constituents to the universe, even if such constituents are infinite. So, CC, so there's a range of constituents. There could be one or there could be an infinite amount. Doesn't matter. Premise two. Given the contingent constituents of the universe, the existence of the universe is very, very unlikely under the hypothesis that some of these constituents are themselves self-caused. Um, I'm going to scratch that is. Um, premise three. Given the contingent constituents of the universe, the existence of the universe is not unlikely under the hypothesis of a constituent uh, constituent that is uh, a first uncaused cause. Therefore, given the contingent constituents of the universe, the existence of the universe strongly supports a first uncaused cause over a non first uncaused cause. So, um, when you think of a contingent constituent, that could be galaxies, planets, stars, cars, humans, leptons, bosons, other particles. For a constituent of the universe to be uncaused, it would mean that it's metaphys or to be uncaused, it would have to be metaphysically necessary. For something to be metaphysically ne necessary, that means it could not have failed to exist. It exists in every possible world. Something is contingent if and only if its existence is uh, if its existence in any possible world is not necessarily false and not necessarily true. In other words, it might or might not have existed. We observe that some things in the, in the universe are contingent. That is, they owe their existence to something else. We do not observe everything, of course, perhaps, in fact, very little of the constituents of the universe as a result. Uh, this argument is not directly about everything in, in return needs no principle governing the contingency of all possible things say for example a principle of sufficient reason so we don't have to have um, we don't 
have to deal with uh, PSR. Um, everything has to have an explanation, and we don't have to deal with um, some of the convoluted uh, defenses of the Kalam cosmological argument. Um, now I've got a, a full defense of this um, that I'll, I'm going to send this PowerPoint uh, to Paul and Sean, and they can give you the notes uh, to give the notes to you. But for the sake of time, basically, this argues that if there's anything that's contingent in the universe, there has to be a first cause. So even if uh, the universe or multiverse goes back in time to infinity, it still doesn't get around the need for a first cause. Now, first cause, not in a temporal sense, but it would be in a um, causal sense. So, for example, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas uh, didn't think that you could philosophically prove a temporal beginning to the universe. He was more than willing to concede a, an infinitely past universe. And so that's why he focused on contingency and disagreed with Al-Ghazali. And he was well aware of Al-Ghazali's work on Kalam, but didn't think that you could um, prove that philosophically. Uh, reasoning processes, um, I'll skip this part. Um, ju it just has to do with the abductive nature um, because when we're working with inference um, it would fall under the uh, experience category um, but this is something that we've kind of already covered with the case rule um, result and whatnot. If we have time we can come back to it. So now getting into some of the um, the now what situations. So if there actually are other many worlds, now what? So now we're going to get some of the interesting theological aspects. So here's the plenitude argument. This is something that uh, Dave Beck did together. We published a paper in Philosophia Christi this past summer, and this was an argument that he used um, in order to substantiate the compossibility of God and the multiverse. So premise one, the initiating and actualizing cause of the universe is unbounded. Two, an individual universe is limited, is a limited set of possible space-time existence. Therefore, it is both plausible and likely that there are multiple universes together representing the full range of possibles as actualized and unlimited source. So plenitude isn't something that we just came up with. You know, this is something that you would find in, in Leibniz, and you may find traces of it in Thomas as well. So um, uh, the idea of the multiverse or multiple worlds goes back at least to the Milesian philosopher Anaximander. His cosmology was highly influ influential on subsequent schools, most importantly the atomists. And from there, especially Epicurus and Lucretius and the Stoics, what is intriguing here is the argument Anaximander uses. Now, of course, he is not an explicit theist. Nevertheless, the essential characteristics of a theistic framework are present, even if they are worked out in a more pantheistic or hylozoistic mode. So let's look at Giordano Bruno. Um, in, uh, with the principle of plenitude in full Christian garb, it reappears full-blown at the emergence of the Enlightenment science by Bruno, Gassendi, uh, Cassinus, directly influenced by their reading of Democritus and Lucretius. Bruno should not be thought of uh, implying a pantheistic or panentheistic model for God. Bruno's claim is that space itself is infinite. So Bruno says, uh, and Bruno, to be fair to, Br to Bruno, um, if you've ever watched any of the most recent um, Cosmos series with Neil deGrasse Tyson, he has completely botched Bruno um, and has been completely unfair to him. Um, so 
Bruno says, I declare God to be completely infinite because he can be associated with no boundary and this ver and this or sorry, and his every attribute is one and infinite. And I say that God is all comprehensive infinity because the whole of him pervades the whole world that every part thereof comprehensively and to infinity. Then by virtue of all those arguments by which the world understood as finite is said to be expedient, good, and necessary. So also should all the innumerable, innumerable other worlds be named expedient and good, and to them the same argument, omnipotence both not grudge being, doth not grudge being. So we also find, I'm not going to read this quote by Newton, but we also find a trace of it in Newton as far as um, infinite space and uh, things repeating in on itself. So Leibniz's principle of plenitude as form, as a form of this argument is well known and will be, um, uh, and can be discussed in Kant as well, in Newton. In Kant's uh, 1755 commentary on Newton, Theory of the Heavens, um, this is where Kant goes through and talks about different natures uh, or the nature of uh, space and perhaps God choosing uh, to have some form of the multiverse, something that would be akin to a level one multiverse, so to speak. So that's traces that we can find in Kant on commentaries on Newton. But what's more interesting is the further back we go uh, with Thomas, in my opinion, and also Clement of Alexandria and Origen. Those are the most interesting in their theological concepts. So Thomas's attraction. Uh, this is from uh, Summa Theologica. For he brought things into being in order that his goodness might be communicated to creatures and be represented by them. And because his goodness could not be adequately represented by one creature alone, he produced many and diverse creatures. That what was wanting to one in the representation of divine goodness might be supplied by another. For goodness, which in God is simple and uniform, and creature is manifold and divided, and hence the whole universe together participates in divine goodness more perfectly and represents it better than any single creature whatever. Now, to be fair to Thomas, Thomas believed in one world. He believed in one universe. But I think it would be safe to say that if Thomas knew about the science that we had today, he would be open to the idea of the multiverse. And this is his doctrine of variety here. Why is there, or why are there more things than just one thing? Well, the more existence there are, the more it reflects God. So if we have, and, that, and that's a good thing, so if we have 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 7 universes, does that adequately reflect an infinitely good God? Well, no, because it's not infinite. So that's kind of where that number will come up again and where um, the correlation between God's goodness and the doctrine of variety will come in with Thomas. So in this I found to be um, very interesting to say that it would it's a good thing that there are multiple things, so to speak. So why stop at just one universe if it's good? Um, it's not an argument in and of itself, but it shows consilience. Okay, Leibniz. Um, I was actually quite surprised when our paper, um, our, our final version of the paper came through because we had worked on the paper for three years. We had presented it at um, EPS uh, several years ago. And um, one of the sections is actually called Sticking It to Leibniz um, because basically we say that Leibniz didn't go far enough. So um, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz developed a similar idea based on the principle of plenitude. He argues that there must be a diversity in, uh, there must be diversity in that which changes. 
This change in diversity is what produces the specification and variety of simple substances. This diversity must involve a multitude in the unity or in the simple. For since all natural change is produced by degrees, something changes and something remains. As a result, there must be a plurality of properties and relations. The principle of plenitude entails that absolutely every way that a world could be is a way that some world is. And absolutely every way that a part of a world could be is a way that some part of the world is. The principle of plenitude has been used to argue against um, modal realism, so to speak, or uh, many worlds, primarily on ethical grounds. The principle is supposed to ensure that there are no gaps in logical space. There is some real concrete universe for every world, for every way a world could be. This entails that there may be a plurality of universes. There are on balance more bad that are on balance more bad than good. Um, a theistic modal realism entails that each universe is a real concrete universe that a perfect being has actualized. In the Leibniz tradition, the principle entails that at least some of the worlds are so bad that no perfect being could actualize them. Hence, Leibniz is committed to this world being the best of all possible worlds. This has been called the less than best problem. The less than best problem sorry, I've got to skip ahead real quick. The less than best problem actually works more in favor of the multiverse than it does against it. Um, and just to equivocate a little bit on modal realism and many worlds, they're not exactly the same, but in the theistic concept, um, I'm just going to roll with it because this is the model that we produced in our paper. The modal realist uh, may concede that the world we find ourselves in is not the best possible world. There are numerous worlds that are far better than this one, and there are worlds that may be worse within the multiverse. A morally perfect being in the Anselmian tradition has no moral obligation to improve the lives of actual free agents. It has been argued that it is impossible that a perfect being should improve the lives of every morally equivalent group of rational agent counterparts in similar or logically distant worlds. There is therefore no moral reason why a perfect being must improve the lives of all actual rational agents and improve the lives of their counterparts. So what we argue is that Leibniz didn't go far enough. If we've got, say, if, if we say that we've got the best world, kind of what Don Page does, um, and say that we've got the best world, unitary physics, the elegant laws of nature, why not the best of plurality of worlds. You have something that would be on balance good, but you have a multitude of them, which keeping in conciliance with Leibniz and in conciliance with the doctrine of variety. And so you don't lose any of the goodness, but you just increase um, the quantity of it. So and this is where it gets very interesting with origin. Now, uh, Clement of Alexandria, uh, he posited that many cosmoi, or universes, um, before the cosmos of Adam, um, he seemed to have made the assertion to make matter timeless. Um, however, Clement returns to the orthodox view that God created everything, including matter in some of his later work. This was not necessary, necessarily a retraction of positing many cosmoi prior to Adam, but it was an amendment to God's role and relationship to the cosmoi, to the universes. So his pupil, Origen, uh, and this is going back to AD 184 to 253, that's during Origen's time, made a substantial contribution to this present task in De Principis, as, um, as we'll see here in this quote, 
As the earliest Christian theologian to explicitly address many worlds, Origen offered a theistic concept of the multiverse in which God still acts in creation. Um, so I think the quotes here are going to be quite important for um, understanding the theological ramifications. So he says, quote, And now I do not understand by what proofs they can maintain their position who assert that worlds sometimes come into existence which are not dissimilar to each other, but in all respects equal. For if there is said to be a world similar in all respects to the present, then it will come to pass that Adam and Eve will do the same things, which they did before. There will be a second time uh, the same deluge and the same Moses will again lead a nation numbering nearly 600,000 out of Egypt, and everything which has been done in life will be repeated. But what may be the number or measures of this, I confess myself ignorant, although if anyone can tell it, I would gladly learn. The point here that Origen is making is that even if there are is a multiverse, there's many worlds, the same ends are going to be accomplished. Accomplished. So he's saying, he's giving exact parallels. There's going to be a flood. Adam's going to do the same thing. Everything's going to repeat itself. That may be the case. But we can at least, the most modest, minimal thing that we can extract from this, aside from a rigid, identical circumstance, is that God still accomplishes his ends. It may be different means. The deluge may be slightly different than the one that we may recall. Uh, the 600,000 coming out of Egypt may be slightly different than what we may recall. But the end result, God's action would still be the same. Now, here is where it gets a little tricky, I confess. I think Christological elements uh, would be the most interesting, is where the most work needs to be done in, in constructing uh, a, a good model for um, a Christian theology and many worlds. So Origen discusses the Christological issues raised by multiple universes. He argues that no matter what the age, quote, age, or referent world is, Christ's atonement will still be efficacious. Quote, but this world, which is itself called an age, is said to be the conclusion of many ages. Now the Holy Apostle teaches that in the age which preceded this, Christ did not suffer, nor even in the age which preceded that again. And I, and I know not that I am able to enumerate the number of anterior ages in which he did not suffer. I will show, however, from the statements of Paul, I have arrived at this understanding. He says, quote, But now once in the consummation of ages he was manifested to take away sin by sacrifice of himself. For he says that he was once made a victim, and in the consummation of ages was manifested to take away sin. Now that, now, <clears throat> excuse me, now that after this age, which is said to be formed for the consummation of other ages, there will be other ages again to follow. We have clearly learned from Paul himself, who says, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. There will be a time when all things are no longer in an age, but when God is in all. So this does not seem to make a distinction whether the atonement functions trans-world or whether one atonement is applied individually to all worlds. It seems origin could go either way, um, but this would be a necessary factor to include for Christian doctrine and for uh, Thomas's uh, factors here as well. Whether God acts trans-world or acts towards the atonement once or many times makes no difference. When the Nicene Creed reads that Christ died once for sins, that could be taken as a quantified reference to this world, or a singular world. However, as previously stated by Origen, and in accordance with simplicity, 
God's actions are necessar necessary and essential to him. Thus, the atonement inevitably can become trans-world. To summarize Origen's contribution, he argued that no matter what the state of affairs God finds before him, he would always act according to the same end or the same telos in that previous quote. Hence, there's a harmony between final causation and the many worlds that may be possible. Um, we do want to note that if uh, we continue with the concept of an Anselmian God and that God is the prime reality and all reality is based in God, then what is, then what is possible is what God chooses to do. Thus, in accordance with Origen and Thomas, Thomas's affirmation of divine action and telos in creation, it would then be impossible for God to do otherwise or counter possible states of affairs. Um, let's see, this, we've got this one last section. Um, I will try to go through it very uh, briefly, but it may be, um, I don't know, Sean, do you uh, want to discuss this part? Well, you can go through this part. Um, we do have to wrap it up fairly quickly, but mm -hmm. if you can go through it within the next five minutes, say. Um, okay. And maybe we'll ask everyone if they have any questions, and if they do, we'll just field the questions right at the end. Okay, not a problem. Okay, so this is this would be a, a model of personal identity. Um, so where are you in this world ensemble? So this would be a quantum... Uh, world tree, so to speak. So think of this as um, different branches or measurements. So we talked about different spins for the electrons or whatever. So um, when we describe, think of this as a coordinate for your history or your branch in this world tree. So we've got a uh, person A, B, D. So that would be considered you. So as long as we consider your segment now, say your present moment D, and the aggregate of past points, then we have a historical identity. We had so you would be the same person you are five minutes ago. You're the same person that you were. 20 years ago. Now, let me see if I can. Um, so, here we go. We've got person A, B, E. Notice that um, A, B, E both share A, B. So, at point B, person A, B, and of course, you know, there's a history down here that both people, persons, would share. So they're identical at this point, A, B. But at B, this, this person splits into new persons. Uh, one will continue on as person D, and one will continue on as person E. So the importance of distinction here is historical identity versus lateral identity. A historical identity would be to say that person ABD, the red person, is one singular person. And though they may sh share a common history, person ABE, the green person, is a completely different person, though they share a common history. The lateral identity is what makes the distinction between observations and the progression of measurements in the quantum world. Now these dotted lines are what's called branch hopping. This is why we don't see, and this, this symbol right here uh, just means it's impossible. So let's say that person uh, at point B, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm giving a Google Hangout, and at point C, uh, this person, let's just say this 
my doppelganger, another version of me, is being attacked by a badger. So the circumstances that would lead up to C, it wouldn't make being attacked by badgers very weird. It may be epistemically uh, random. Like, I, it, it scared me. I wasn't expecting to be attacked by a badger right now. But if we trace back all the circumstances and I knew that somebody was creeping up my stairwell, someone opened up my door and let badgers into my flat, that would make sense. But there's, no, there's not going to be something called branch hopping. That's why we're not observing random things popping in and out of existence um, or anomalous things. We may still have an epistemic anomalies that we can't explain, but these would be ontological anomalies, such as all of a sudden you're listening in Calgary and all of a sudden through the back door comes uh, a group of horses that are coming and they're going to trample you if you don't get out of the way. So that's why we don't observe weird, so to speak, weird things happening on the ontological and physical level. So this would just be a brief explanation of personal identity through, uh, through time, or it, if you don't want to say time, you can say from observation to observation. Now, um, the biggest thing to remember here is just the difference between historical identity and the lateral identity, even though uh, you may share history with other persons that will eventually become other persons, um, you will still have a common history. So um, I imagine that may spark several different questions, but um, let's, uh, let's open it up for questions. I know I've gone a little bit over time, but let's see what we have. Okay, well, thanks, Max. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, I know Justin has a question here first, so we'll let him have it. Hey, doing, Max? Hello. So, uh, thanks. I want to thank you, man, for coming out and having a talk with us. Uh, it's not too often you get a guy who's, you know, uh, on his way in a field who's going to uh, to explain stuff. You know, it's always difficult as an apologist, I find, to, to get good sources and stuff like that. And you've always been willing. You've always helped me throughout the years. In you know, the couple of years that I've known you now, uh, you've always been willing to help. So I just want to thank you, and, and thank you for coming up tonight and, and, and giving up the talk. Oh, thank you, and you're welcome. Now, I want to, obviously, you know, with philosophy, what we want to do is we want to we want to attack, uh, we want to attack things, because, you know, a, a truth should stand up to anything, right? And so... In a recent column in Nature, uh, on uh, the Nature website, um, Paul Steinhardt, who is a, uh, a professor of physics at Princeton, uh, he says this. So this is the objection that actually gives the inflationary or the inflationary paradigm. So in responding to the bicep two problem that he had uh, with, with, the, with the, the, the instance of, the, of, of bicep two, they said basically there are people who said that regardless of that problem, inflationary cosmology is still okay. And so here's what he has to say. He says, uh, the inflationary paradigm is so flexible that it is immune to experimental and observational tests. First, inflation is driven by a hypothetical scalar field, the inflation which has pro uh, properties that can be adjusted to produce effectively any outcome. Uh, second, inflation does not end with a universe with uniform properties, but almost inev inevitably leads to a multiverse with an infinite number of bubbles in which the cosmic and physical properties vary from bubble to bubble. The part of the multiverse that we observe corresponds to a piece of just one such bubble. Uh, scanning over all possible bubbles in the multiverse, everything that can physically happen does happen to an infinite number of times. Or, sorry, does happen an infinite number of times. Uh, no experiment can rule out a theory that allows for all possible outcomes, hence the paradigm of inflation is un unfalsifiable. So how would you respond to, to uh, Paul's claim there? <clears throat> uh, as far as the unfalsifiability aspect to it, um, in the realm of science, I think it's 
you know, it could be the case that it may turn out to be unfalsifiable. But does that make it unscientific? Um, I don't think so. I think it may be preferable for some things to be falsifiable, that we can demonstrate it to be false. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are several different models of uh, inflationary scenarios. Um, so it just depends on whether one, in my opinion, whether one wants to accept it as a viable explanation or model for the universe or the multiverse, if it's falsified if it's falsifiable or if it's unfalsifiable. Um, I've made arguments that falsifiability in the Popperian, Karl Popper sense, um, it's preferred. It's, it would be very nice if we could falsify everything. But I don't think that's the case. I don't think we can falsify everything. Um, but I don't think that's something that we should neglect. And if we do have some kind of evidence for it, um, and I think that we do have some kind of evidence for it, and I don't think we should hang our hat on just the bicep to um, measurements. Um, I think it, it, it still deserves a seat at the table. I wouldn't discount it just because um, all, the, all probabilities may be one. I, I think it still deserves at least a seat at the table. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, you bet, Webb. So, okay. Uh, all right. No, I think that's pretty much it. No, we have uh, one more question, actually. Thanks, Max. Have a good night, bud. Thank you. <laughs> oh, it's good morning. It's almost 4 a.m. here. <laughs> yeah, it's 4 a.m. Yeah, I, got, I have two questions. Hopefully, they're quick. Um, the first one has to do with the, the material you presented, and one of the and the second has to do with the ramifications. Uh, okay. The first, uh, the first one. Uh, uh, in the, in the slide that you talked about, I think it was just prior to the Bruno quote, you talked about a universe being a possible set of spatial and temporal extents. But the question is about the level two um, multiverse you were talking about, how two bubbles um, interacted with each other. Does that mean there's a spatial relationship between these two? Like something on this slide? Uh, I want to get to the right reference for you. Can you repeat the question? I think it was back from here. Um, you were showing background cosmic radiation plots where they had used algorithms to clear up. Yes, this one. OK. You had said that those blobs indicate the interaction of two different universes? Yes. So there's a spatial relationship between these two universes? Yes. So if you look at it this way, so I don't know if you can, can you see my arrow? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the inside the universe is here. The bubbles are, well, in the picture they're touching here. So there would be this space, I don't, I don't know if you can read this, I, I would have to make it bigger on my screen. But so this would just be empty inflating space, just like just as the space here is inflating, the space in between the other universes are inflating as well. So if we look at the the computer simulation, you'll notice that like some peaks are closer to each other than other peaks. And so the closer the peaks are, the closer the valleys are. And we, each peak is a big bang and everything gets settled down in the valleys. So, you know, the closer they are, the more likely, and depending on the cosmological constant, really, the expansion rate, that energy momentum, depends on whether or not it might expand into another bubble. And so that's where the values may differ if it produces signatures of a bubble collision. And so... I guess I would suppose that t statistically it would be very rare to see a bubble collision. And so for us to observe a bubble collision in our universe would be astronomically rare to have inflating space 
collide with another inflating space over inflating space. Um, it seems like we are, it's almost another version of Zeno's paradox of motion. It's like we're tra traversing an, an infinite amount of space to get to another infinite amount of space. Um, but yeah, that, that's part of uh, the inflationary scenario. Okay, my second, my second question has to deal with um, the ramifications of believing a level three multiverse. And as an illustration, I'll say that there's a Nazi guard with his finger on the button for a gas chamber to eliminate 5,000 Jews or so. And he thinks to himself, well, we're in a multiverse, and uh, there's a multiverse that exists where I don't push the button, where these people live, equally as valid a reality as the one that exists where I do push the button. And so he consoles himself with the fact that not in this world, but in a different world, they continue to exist. What does this have to? What ramifications are there to human dignity, to human value, given that we, that these realities are as equally real as our our own? Yeah, that's a really good question because some of the some of the uh, major objections to multiverse scenarios, particularly on um, the ethical and theological levels concern uh, ethical questions. I came across a paper that had a horrible title, but it was How I Learned to Let the Children Drown. Um, <laughs> and it, it's kind of, it adopts a very utilitarian ethic. Um, you know, it, for the greater good, so I'm going to, I'm going to gas everybody, but, uh, in the end, on that, on balance, the whole world ensemble is going to be good, even though I'm going to gas this many universes and this many people. But one of the, the particular to the model that um, Dave Beck and I, Dave Beck and I have been working on, is that a multiverse is really just one possible world so to speak. So if we take the language of possible worlds, and normally we think of them as just abstract, you know, um, they are describing a maximal state of affairs. The multiverse is really just one possible world. So there are other worlds in which there are single universes, there are other possible worlds in, what, in which there are other multiverses. So it's kind of expanding the semantic domain of possible world in its application to the multiverse and saying that, okay, the multiverse, even though it may contain an infinite set of universes, good, bad, and ugly, uh, will still have, um, it's still one possible world and it could be a different multiverse. But it's also, that would I would argue theologically be counter essential. So, um, or that ethical situation where God would gas everything. So, we wouldn't apply the physical, like the unitary physics, that the probability of everything being one uh, happening. So, if it's God acting, so to speak, introducing causes that would, we would say that are evil that would be counter-essential to God. So God, it's like saying that God commands rape or God commands torturing children. That's not just something that's counterfactual. It's something that's counter-essential in, in the sense that it's an impossible world in which that occurs. So if we try to derive a probability from something that would be impossible, we would get a big error on our calculator it would be an impossible state of affairs that could occur for God to command um, anything that would be evil um, if we're sticking with some type of di divine command theory. Um, but if we want to stick with, okay, well, it's not... We still had a Holocaust, and we still had all these bad things happen. Um, there, there certainly could be universes in which... Uh, the moral balance is less than, say, this universe that we observe. 
Um, that certainly may be the case. Um, but like I said, um, under an Anselmian God, a, a maximally perfect being, God has no obligation to uh, make our lives better. But keeping that in mind, um, we wouldn't expect God to create a universe of um, rabbits that just continually die over and over again. A universe of just rabbits existing and then they just die and die and die and die and they just keep dying, resuscitate, die, and they just keep dying. That's contrary to it. Um, so working out the moral balances and the ethical uh, approaches are something some eth ethicists are working out. Um, and uh, there's a book coming out by Rutledge on God and the multiverse uh, that works a lot with the ethical ramifications like you bring up. Um, you know, how do we do this? And, you, you know, you've got papers like How I Learned to Let the Children Drown, uh, these utilitarian ethics because, of, well, I'm not going to save the children because my counterpart is going to save the children, so I don't really need to do it. So in some world, that's going to work. And then you've got to try to balance different trans world actions and have them apply. So uh, have them have an ethical balance in our world. So it's kind of it would be kind of weird to try to have that balance of trans world actions and have the ethical efficacy, if that makes any sense. I don't know if I answered that question for you. I will definitely have to review uh, the whole presentation to see if any of it made sense at all. <laughs> But thank you, thank you. It was very um, interesting, if nothing else. Well, thank you. Okay, so for the interest of time, I think we'll have to cut it off there. So I'd like to thank you again on behalf of the NCAC Max for literally burning the midnight oil. I mean, what it's after four o'clock there right now in Edinburgh. So we really appreciate your taking the time, um, giving this excellent presentation, and uh, just caring enough to come and share your your uh, your thoughts and what you've learned through your studies with with some laymen and we just we can't thank you enough so we hope that you have a great night and uh, hopefully you can function tomorrow in spite of the lack of sleep and uh, I know I'll probably be up all night thinking about some of the things you were talking about so sure have thank you it's been a pleasure excellent talk to you soon bye